news, we're going to turn to our Hall of Fame. So we're doing the 2002 retiring class this week. Um, and as I like to do, I kind of went back and had a look at what was going on in rugby league at the time. And uh, interesting that we were talking about concussions earlier because I, I read something that just really sickened me. Um, I'll just I'll read this to you. Emotional Penrith coach John Lane continues to wage war against the NRL to protect his son Martin from high tackles. Lang Senior says the major problem is players trying to assert themselves when tackling his son, whose running style has been blamed in some quarters in the wake of his 10th concussion in his 114-match career. Um, we know now, which I don't think we knew to that degree at the time, but 10 concussions, that's really bad. I hope he's all right now. I, I think he ended up getting knocked out like a dozen times over the course of his career I was reading today. Interestingly enough, I, I was just looking him up today to see what he was doing, whether he was doing doing well, and you know that sort of thing. Um, so he's working as a, like, I guess, a, like a pharmaceutical sales rep kind of role, and, and apparently he's doing doing quite well. But just a few days ago, he came out and had this rant about how he doesn't, he wouldn't advise anyone over sixteen to play rugby league. And the concussion and the head knocks are really bad and, and all the rest of it. So I don't know if there's anything behind that in terms of how he's doing. I mean, uh, that would suggest that there is some issues there, wouldn't it? But mm. um, at least he's working and everything like that. It seems to be lost yeah. to the game, which is no good. But We all remember how Martin Lang r- ran and how he played. It is interesting You hear, when you heard John Lang there talk about how people say it's oh it's just the way he runs he brings it on himself you don't want to shift blame but at the same time like it it was pretty obvious wasn't it the way he ran well it it just wouldn't um it wouldn't um step no there was just no deviation at all any defender could just line him up time and time again i don't know why that wasn't coached out of him um and his, his father coached him so but I think the idea of it was, you know, just get the maximum meter eaterage, you know, just run straight. But then if you're an actual uh, stationary target, <laughs> it turns you into a tackling about it, doesn't it? Mm, yeah. I guess the one thing is a lot of his... This article I found from 2002 gave a long list of all the, the hits he took. And there were like a lot of high tackles on him. And it makes you think, well, if defenders knew exactly what he was going to do, he wasn't going to be looking to pass, he wasn't going to be stepping, he was just going to run straight at you. Shouldn't there be less high tackles on him because you've got all the time in the world to just line him up and drill him? Yeah, well, I would think so, yeah, but that wasn't the case, was it? Mm. Another name from that era, probably uh, you remember as a Dragons fan, um, Nathan Long. Mm. He, I think, retired due to head injuries, didn't he? Uh, I don't remember that. I just remember him kind of petering out. But you could be right. I think he used to. He used to seem to get like head, head highs all the time. And it was yeah, the same, yeah. The same era. It was a sort of similar mm. setup from memory. Maybe I'm misremembering that. But um, there's so many more head knock uh, cases when you really think about it over the years. And yeah, seen, yeah. And we're seeing with the NFL study, like it's just a, an outrageous amount of problems post um, playing. Yeah, so a pretty sickening study came out this week where they looked at the brains of 111 former NFL players and found that 110 had evidence of, of brain damage. Um, that might have been there before they started playing because that game sucks. But <laughs> 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 I'm kidding, it's not too bad. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's worrying times, isn't it? Mm. But... Uh, yeah, anyway, we don't have a solution to that, obviously. Um, just just the other thing, when I, when I was looking looking back at 2002, pretty crazy origin series that year. That was, of course, the, the Brett Hodgson getting dragged out by Talis series. You had uh, Talis getting sin-binned in game one by Bill Harrigan. That was two years after the him being sent off for calling Harrigan a cheat. And... Um, after that happened, Queensland pushed for Harrigan to get dropped. 
And <laughs> I, I love this. I'll, I'll just read this out. Queensland Rugby League officials last night expressed concerns for referee Bill Harrigan's safety after losing a bid to have him sacked from State of Origin. He is not well liked up here. It's not just paper talk and officials jumping up and down, Ross Livermore said last night. (laughs) People are pretty irate. We don't want some idiot jumping the fence, so we are definitely going to have to put on extra security around the perimeter fence. (laughs) How Queensland's that? I know. And then uh, New South Wales fired back and, and said... Queensland are usually the ones asking for Harrigan and then a couple of things don't go their way and they're trying to get rid of him. (laughs) Nothing ever changes, does it? (laughs) (laughs) But uh, the funny thing about that series also is you had Gordon Tallis as Queensland captain, Andrew Johns as New South Wales captain. They were both vying for the Australian captaincy. So at the same time that Tallis is getting sent off for swearing and abusing Bill Harrigan... He's abusing fans, blowing up. He's, he still feels like put out when he gets overlooked for the Australian captain job. But honestly, with Joey's off-field behaviour. Yeah, well, that's the funny thing. Like Joey doesn't really present a, that compelling a case either, does he? Absolutely not. Oh, and the last thing, this is like a sliding doors moment. Uh, Craig Bellamy had a meeting with, I think he was still an assistant at Brisbane at the time. He had a... He had a um, meeting with West Tigers to potentially take over as coach there. The The meeting didn't go well and, and he rejected them in the end, uh, citing publicity over player support for assistant coach Paul Langmack influenced him. <laughs> and it's so funny to think that even a, a playing generation before the, the Farrah and, and Marshall camp, player power was ruling the West Tigers. Amazing, isn't it? And they had not learnt a single thing. Yeah. <laughs> they could have had Craig Bellamy, but the players wanted Paul Langmack. Yeah, but the problem with this is if he went there, he might have um he might have gone um like his, his whole his whole thing might have been gone, you know? Like he Yeah, a yeah. Terrible squad or something like that and didn't yeah, have exactly. the champions. And then up against it with warring boards and factions and all the rest of it. Instead he had a very um amenable board with uh, mm. an executive with Brian Waldron at the <laughs> Um So, yeah, so we'll, we'll turn to the, the Hall of Fame itself. So you had Tim Brasher, Ivan Cleary, Matthew Johns, Alan Langer, Adam Muir, Brett Mullins, uh, Ken McGuinness and Ken Nagus. Um, let's start with Ken McGuinness. Yeah, well, let, let's do Ken and Kevin because... Kevin re- retired the next year. Uh, neither of them Hall of Famers, but um, solid well, players. Ken, especially. He was one of my favourites when he came out. I thought he was destined for, for big things. He was in the, the Matt Sears class, that sort of excitement machine straight out of the gates. Um, and uh, didn't really go on with it. Another career interrupted by Super League and there some bad squads he was in and stuff like that. Some th- Those West team were appalling. But uh, five origins, which surprised me. I didn't think he played that many. No, I never thought. Was, was I thought that he, a, he... ARL origins? No, no, because I think he debuted in like 98. So I think it was 98, 99. Wow, I guess he made the full team. He was a good player. Because so, all, all you tend to remember of him is when, when Tommy Radonikus left him on the bench for the, the full game. But the uh, funny thing is he retired at 26. Yeah, that's what I mean. It could have been, could have been anything. So, so, so what was the reasoning behind that? He lost the passion. Right. Yeah. Always sad. Mm. Yeah, and then Kevin, yeah. I think Kevin was maybe a year older, so he couldn't have been that old when he retired either because he retired in 2003. Was He, he was involved with the drug scandal, wasn't he? Yeah. The yeah. of drugs, yeah. Yeah. Was that at the West Tiger? Yeah. Yeah, him they and Fields. They've had problems there for a decade and a half. Yeah. I'm going to talk about Ivan Cleary. I'll I'll just read his numbers. 186 games, 11 years, didn't play any origins or tests, uh, no premierships, had four clubs. The funny thing about those four clubs, I don't really remember much of him at Manly, but Norths, Roosters and Warriors, I, I I just imagine him playing for each of those clubs for about 10 years. He was... 
something in the lines of a Michael Gordon today. Yeah. In the I know mean, Michael Gordon's played Origin, but never going to be considered in, in, in the top five or six in the position, but highly valuable to a club. Mm. Um, he, defensively, I, I see a lot of Billy Slater in him in that he played well above his weight, solid as a rock. He didn't have any worries about him under the high ball. Positionally, he just was where he was supposed to be every time. Yeah, I think I've undersold him on the Michael Gordon comparison. He's above Michael Gordon, but um, when you saw him in squads, you were just like, oh, great, Ivan Cleary. Like, that's that's one good performance you can be guaranteed. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so he never played Origin. But funny thing is, when I was reading stories about this year, he was considered a potential Origin bolter in 2002. I don't know how many players are Origin bolters on the eve of their retirement. <laughs> Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, th- I thought he was a really solid player. And as I said, he he just seemed to fit in and I, I associate him so much with, with each of those clubs he played for. But also the goal kicking as well. Let's not forget yeah. that. Yeah. That was uh, outstanding. Um, mm. So he started off, did he start at Manly under Ridge? Yeah. So that was a roadblock right away. Um, yeah. Uh, it was class from the outset. Yeah. Um, who else? We, Kenny Nagus, you'd have very fond memories of, I take it. Ken Nagus, I've got the fondest of memories for. Um, not Fijian, but definitely a flyer. Um, mm-hmm. unbel- unbelievably graceful. And just a Ferrari of an athlete. Um, 94 grand final, forget about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on on the Facebook, uh, listener Todd Slater made a good point about the the corner post rule. Like, can you imagine some of those wingers not having to deal with that stupid rule back in the nineties? One of the all time great rule changes. Mm. Um, and Andrew and Negus would have just been half in the grandstand scoring tries <laughs> if, that, if that was around back then. Um, in many ways, it was a it was a skill to, to get low and finish in those days. You know. Yeah. Um, and he was, oh, geez, he was good. He was a great player. Really, really solid. Uh, I'll just, I'll read his numbers. 142 games, 11 years in the league, five origins, five tests, and the 94 premiership. He, it's a, such a short career. It, it, it didn't really shine bright for very long, but we've been through this before with the other years. Clyde, Stewart all played their best yeah. footy in, in the first half, and his first half was incredible. mm I don't really remember too much of him at the end. Like those Canberra teams were pretty ordinary, and he just seemed to kind of fade out of my memory. Yeah, um, well, he, he wasn't doing the, the same things. That's why. Yeah, yeah. And then then they went to that dark green jersey, and I just I couldn't watch them at that point. <laughs> the, the jersey really killed them, didn't it? <laughs> oh, he went to uh, two. Yeah, that's okay. So he played um, ninety four state of origin. So that was the proper one. Then he played Super League origin and Super League tests. Mm. So yeah, I mean, so, you put that up to like eight origins, eight tests. You know, that's that's very credible. Like, I still think ultimately he's short of the Hall of Fame. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like to me, he's a he's not Steve Renoff, but he's he's in that vibe, that class of uh, game breaker, electrifying, um, makes your stomach rise like a roller coaster when he got the ball. You mm. had, had all that. Yeah. Um, as you said a few few episodes ago, when you're talking about the way your old uncles used to speak, it was like he was a good player. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's um, th- there's no one's going to say, "Oh, Ken Davis couldn't play." <laughs> no. Yeah, exactly. Um, one bloke I wanted to mention, I, I think he's well short of Hall of Fame, but uh, Adam Muir, he was just this production line of these types of forwards coming from Newcastle. In that that was Halcyon days. Yeah. The, 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 he was one of the... Um, he was like the second generation John Cartwright with the, with the offload. Mm. Magical offload. Yeah. Um, 13 origins, two tests. Um, well, won the 97, not, won sorry, the 97 uh, premiership, premiership and then went to Norths the next year. Probably a mistake because... Um, 
they had a great great side there in Newcastle in that era. I, yeah. It's funny, I'm, I'm looking up a game for the Matthew Johns discussion here, and I'm looking at the pack of, of 1995. Mm. Marquette, McCormack, Harrigan, Muir, Tracy, Glanville, mm. Bench, Chris Joint, Mark Sargent, Bill Peden. Wow. Forget about that. Yeah, yeah. Very good player. Uh, well, well let's, let's stay on Newcastle and talk about Matthew Johns. I'll just read his numbers out. 197 games, nine years in the league, four origins, eight tests, and the 97 premiership. Um, and what years were the origins again? Well, so 95 was... Do you play one or two then? I, I think he played at least one game post Super League, but definitely the Super League era helped his his numbers in that front. I'll look it up right now, actually. Um, but so I've got a bit of a beam my bonnet about this. It kind of shits me that people diss his rugby league career so hard. I think he was a gun player. I thought, yeah, he, he was a really good player. 95 to 98 was his rep career. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to share a, a particular personal memory of him because I looked up the game, I remember it like it was yesterday, 25th of June, 1995, Marathon Stadium, Knights versus Bulldogs, 42-0. And he tore them to shreds that day. Mm. Um, scored a try, I don't know how many line breaks he had. He was just stepping through the line with Fittler-esque uh, steps. But this is the, the Bulldogs side, Lamb, Polamauer, Halligan, Timu, Silver, Dallas, Darren Britt, Hetherington, Steve Price, Gillies, Dimmick, Pay, like the big gun Canterbury side. 1995, obviously, mm, the big gun yeah. Canterbury side. And they won 42-0. Yeah. Um, and it was just a massacre. And he was the, he was the player of the game for mine. Mm. Remember it was yesterday. And he was untouchable that day. And... Um, uh, I don't know how what he's considered like as a defensive five eighth, probably not the biggest body getting around. But attack wise, he was a, I was going to say freak, but I don't know what that word. Outstanding attacker. <laughs> Do you think maybe overrated in his day, underrated since he's retired? Um, possibly, maybe a bit harsh there. But um, I just think playing next to the best player of all time makes you. Uh, maybe maybe underrates you. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I, I always, at the time, I, I thought he was good, but I thought he also got a bit of an easy ride at times getting those rep jerseys. Um, well, but he was a game breaker. That's what, that's what he was there for. He was on the bench in origin. Um, so like, compare it to Stephen Mark War. So Mark Ward didn't average as much as um, Steve by a, by a long margin, right? But no mm. one's going to say that Mark Ward wasn't a gun. No. He, for mine, he gets the easy ride just um, based on the stats, just on his class. And then in my view, it's, oh, he's, he's not Andrew Jones. Well, who is? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, being from Newcastle, I kind of have heard this my whole life, you know, that he was somehow not a good player. It's like, hang on. But the other thing is, if he wasn't Andrew Johns's brother, and I know that's fairly condescending to what he achieved in the game to refer to him as that, don't we just consider him another, I don't know, Adam Dykes? Better than that. But, you know, like, I don't think we'd be talking about him as much as we we do now. I don't know Maybe. if he... But if he played by himself and, don't, and had control of the team, would he have been able to... Play better. I don't know. Hard to answer that. Yeah, yeah, it is a tough one. I mean, regardless, I, I think we're in agreement that he's quite a, quite a way short of the hall. Um, yeah, well, comparing to Ken Nagus, I mean, well, I mean, at his position, Ken Nagus was probably legitimately the best winger in the game for at least a couple of years there. Matthew Johns, top five. I don't think he ever made it to top three. You know. It's saying that a lot more congestion in the nineties five eights as we've had in other years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fitler daily. Yeah, etc. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I mean, probably don't want to go too too deep into Matthew Johns. Maybe a bit short. I, I don't want to rule him out one hundred percent till the end of this discussion. But um, I just wanted to put my point across that I thought he was a better player than people remember him for. Yeah. Okay. Well. Now, I, th I think 
I think we all know where this is going with Alan Langer, so I, I might I, I want to hold off. We'll do him last because he deserves a, a you know some expansive talk. So uh, I just want to talk about Brett Mullins. I'll, I'll read his numbers: two hundred nine games, twelve years, seven Origins, eight Tests, uh, the ninety four fullback of the year, uh, two clubs, two premierships. Of course, the ninety four Canberra premiership and. Retired after the 2002 Roosters Premiership. Criminally underutilised at rep level. Was he though, or was he just not... D- did he just not have the staying staying power? Well, I think it's... I was going to say it's well documented. I think it's a um, open secret that his off-field lifestyle probably wasn't conducive to long-term rep footy. Mm, yeah. <laughs> but... Um, but um, Gut feeling he should be in the hall for mine, and and then the fact that he finished off with that premiership seals it. Um, I, I should should add before we go too far. So those those numbers I quoted the seven origins eight tests I included his Super League um, Super League rep games in that. So I think he had five actual origins and played two of the Super League tri series. Well, five origins um, is quite solid. Never played origin at fullback. Was on the wing in all five. Um, they were spread over ninety four and ninety five, but I got to say, though, oh sorry, ninety four and ninety six, because obviously Super League made him ineligible in ninety five. So he was the best fullback in the game in ninety five. So you'd well, say there's there's three origins there for him. Let me um, let me quote friend of the show Cody Dobbs yet again. Can you tell the story of rugby league without? Brett Mullins, and the answer to me is no, you can't. I th- I actually think you can because he was so good for that two or three year period, but but that was kind of it, you know. And I think that Canberra team would probably have won ninety four with or without him. Uh, yeah, but we're talking about a guy who had a, a Jared Hayne run. In '95, yeah, about f- five games where he made like six hundred meter tries. Right, he's got three of the best tries of all time to his name. Mm. Um, he, anyone you ask, was Brett Mullins a good fullback? Hundred percent of people will say yes. I loved Brett Mullins. He, he, I don't know if there's anyone in that era who I would rather watch. Like, give someone a ball and let him take off. I, I think I'd. He he's in the Renoff class, if not above him for that couple of year period. It was a short, um, bright star burning, but yeah. um, but then he come back at the end and played that awesome role, uh, an elder statesman, still finishing the ball strong on the wing for Sticky. But again, I mean, I think that Roosters team wins that comp with or without him. I don't know how yeah, much you, you can say that about anybody. You could say that the Broncos would have won with Steve Renoff as well. Like, yeah, it's um that's not a good indicator. I don't think. Fair point, but I don't think I don't the the ninety four premiership. I think that legitimately adds to his case. The two thousand and two premiership, I think, is more of a nice story. I don't know that it has much of a has much weight as an argument as to his Hall of Fame. It's nice. Worth. Though. What's that? It's nice. It's nice. It's nice it, finish. It, it rounds off the career nicely. It maybe gives him gives him numbers that he deserves based on his class and ability. But you're talking about the 2002 Premiership like it was certainly some sort of passenger. It was it was very good. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I I think that's you don't remember him when you think about Brett Mullins. You don't think of him. In that era, and the the kind of role player he became, you think of him in that Canberra jersey, just running a hundred meters. Yeah, and I don't think he did that for long enough to be seriously considered as good as he up. He undoubtedly was a brilliant player, but he just wasn't a brilliant player for long enough. What I liked about him was his he's a pure footballer. Like yeah. he, he had that ungainly. Running style somehow and still super fast, like not much of a body, like <laughs> cr- crazy hairstyle, <laughs> like <laughs> and and just his his running style and the way he stepped and swerved, he looked like one of those guys where it seemed like he was surprising himself. 
Like he, he didn't know where he was going to go next. To me, he was a bit of a he was a less graceful Brett Kenny. He had the swerve, which you mm. don't see very often. Yeah. Um, if I was Joey, I'd be saying, "Look at the balance," you know, like mm-hmm. he, his balance was um, phenomenal. Yeah. But th- um, for me, the reason why I'm so big on on Mullins, not just I'm a Canberra fan, is because of the feeling you get thinking about those those that era. Like he's. The same as Renoff, he had. He's got the same same sort of feeling as Renoff, where, um, just on their feet in the stands every time we touch the ball. And I know exactly the feeling you're talking about, and I feel it too about Mullins. But I just think it's it's just too short a window to really put him in in the hall. Let, let's just, got- let's just go go through the intangibles. So, can you tell the story of the game? With Adam, you said no. I said yes, but I know what you mean. Does he pass the grandkids test? I think he does. Yeah, he does. But with the qualifier that it was just for a very short time. But so is Reg Gasnier. Yeah, well no, no, that's that's Reg Gasnier did it for nine years. Well <laughs> sure did. <laughs> I, I just have to step the mark there. <laughs> the the hello um, turf of the dragons. There. Sorry, mate. No, I mean, I, I think there's a substantial difference between the career of Reg Gasnier and Brett Mullins. The, the, right. the, the same with Renault. Withdrawn. We, yeah, withdrawn. Thank, thank you. <laughs> um, did he strike fear in, into the opposition? Absolutely. In 94 and 95, he did. Well, just let me ask you this then. You're telling the story of rugby league, and you're talking about the, the early to mid '90s. Who, who are you going to mention? He's one of the names, but I just I don't think we can seriously consider him given the the shortness of his window. I want to keep him in the loop. I don't want to rule him out yet. I mean, okay. he's got to be ahead, he's got to be ahead of Nagus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think all the players we've just talked about, I don't think there's any room for, for any of those blokes. Mullins is the one that I have a hard time ruling a line through because of how good he was, but ultimately I just don't think he has a Hall of Fame career. I see I see your points. They're well made, but um, it's it's the it's the intangibles that I'm relying on, really, on this one. Yeah. But let's put him in the, in the not uh, ruled out basket. Okay. Yet. Well, I'm happy to keep him alive, and... Here's an interesting counterpoint, actually. It's funny that they, they retired in the same year because the bloke who kept him out of the New South Wales fullback jersey, Tim Brasher, I'll read through his, his nu- numbers. 244 games, 13 years in the league, 21 origins, 14 tests, won the 96 Dallium fullback of the year, played for three clubs, never won a premiership. Those origins, he played 19 origins straight between 93 and 98. And that's what's going to get him in if he gets in because his club career was not in that class. Yeah, well... One of the great origin players. Yeah, yeah. I mean, played for dud team after dud team. I mean, it started strong being picked for Balmain in 89 out of high school. Then proceeded to spend the rest of the 90s playing with a terrible Balmain team heading over to Souths, playing with a terrible Souths team till they were kicked out of the comp, going up to the Cowboys before the Cowboys were the Cowboys. Uh, He ended up playing 19 games for them over three seasons, sat out the 2001 season with injury, came back and retired mid-year in 2002. So, yeah, a very... I'll tell you who we're looking at right here. We're looking at a, um, a New South Wales rowdy. That's Yeah, that, that's, that's a really, really good good point. It's a saying the club the club's issues sorted out of their control. Um, yeah. Reliable to a to a amazing degree in the rep uh, field. Not only would it not not let you down at the original level, like he's the first guy I picked, and so the, um my my um, good good friend David, we talk a lot of footy, and he'll bring up Brasher regularly, just going kind of like you know how good was he for us, you know, in the Blues and um. Just, just just loves Tim Brash and, and hates the Balmain Tigers, incidentally. So, guys remember him for, for his origin. Yeah, well, f- 
Funny, funnily enough, my friend Dane, who I've mentioned on this show plenty of times before, who's a Queenslander, he told me once that Brasher was the bloke he feared in that New South Wales team. Oh, always delivered. So, see, I used to think that when I was watching it, going, oh, Mullins is a better player than Brasher. Why isn't he there? And then, then I'd go, well, he's not as reliable as Brasher for Origin. Mm. And then that was that was the truth. And when you use words like reliable, it makes you think of just a, a solid defensive fullback who wouldn't let you down. Brasher was all that, but he was also a genuine attacking weapon. Great Absolutely. speed, great step. Um, much stronger than he looked as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, he didn't have the brilliance and the and the and the, and the rawness of Mullins, just the raw talent. But got more out of his talent. I um, I think he had a Hall of Fame career, but it, it's almost the exact opposite of Mullins. Like you said, you know, I don't really get that feeling. Like the words Tim Brasher doesn't have this. Like my 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 the hairs hairs on my arm aren't standing up. You know, yeah, when absolutely. I think about Brett Mullins. They kind of do. So I get your, your point about Mullins. But what about the fact that the finish was so... South was a nightmare and, um, like you said, you can't help that. Like, it's just gone mm. with Dud Scott. Yeah. Um, and then the Cowboys was a problem. And then he went over to Canada, I think, and ran a bar, I think. Yeah, from yeah. Memory. <laughs> and was, was caddying for some uh, semi-pro golfer. Um, he's been lost to the game somewhat. Yeah. Um, but... <sighs> I don't want to be flipping either and say he's not a Hall of Famer because like he's pretty bloody close if he's not. We we talked about it often that it can't just be about numbers, but you have to have numbers. I think he's got numbers that Mullins doesn't have. The um, the rowdy argument's a big one for me. Um, we can't really bring premierships into it. We know they're desirable, but if, if you're not in a premiership capable side, what can you do? But I mean, do we want a Hall of Fame f- full of Gold Coast Chargers players, or do we want a Hall of Fame that represents <laughs> the, the best players from the best clubs? You know. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, he was playing Origin in two thousand for Christ's sake. Yeah. Amazing. Like, I mean, I think he had a Hall of Fame career. Yeah, I'm leaning towards it too. I don't want to be. I don't want to hundred percent that yet, though. Okay. Well. Let- I think this is one that we need to talk about on the forums because yeah. Mullins, Mullins v. Brasher would be a nice little discussion for the for the uh, listener input because um, I'm actually torn on them. I, I, I hear what you're saying. The numbers on, on Brasher's rep career probably put him above Mullins, but then the intangibles for for mine, Mullins have got him hands down over Brasher. I'll just uh, just one one. Th- I'll just read this from from Dane Wright. He commented on the Facebook page. Um, Brasher up there with the best fullbacks I've ever seen and can't think of a New South Wales player who rates higher on the struck fear scale absolutely electric runner of the ball that's some pretty high praise there yeah I mean thanks for the comment Dan appreciate that but it's like I don't know whether he was more I would consider him to be more consistent than electric as a ball runner That's that was my memories of him um, it wasn't like he wasn't a good ball runner. It was just like uh, I don't remember him slicing through, you know, through two three times a game like Mullins did, Steve mm. Renoff did. All right, so let, let's let's do the intangibles with Brasher. Can you tell the story of rugby league without him? You probably can, I would say. Um, does he pass the grandkids test? No. Did he strike fear into the opposition? Well, we just heard it. I think he does. I don't know if he doesn't. I think he does pass the grandkids test. You think he does? You're talking about one of the great origin players. Top five blues for sure. What, at his position or all time? All time. I mean, like, probably the most reliable player we've ever had for the blues. Uh, yeah, I mean, 21 origins and... I don't know. I, th- I think that's that's overselling a bit to say he's top five New South Wales player of all time. Maybe. Still, I mean, uh, he's not too far behind Freddie and ET for games as well. No. Yeah, that's up there. And then the last one, is he iconic? I don't think he is. 
No, I think in the Canadian pub scene. <laughs> so his intangibles are probably less impressive than Mullins's. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I think there's a really interesting argument between the two of them. So maybe we will hold off on those for now. Um, no point mucking, mucking about. Alan Langer is in the Hall of Fame. So I'll just read read through his numbers. 258 games, 13 years in the league, uh, 34 origins, 25 tests, uh, 1996 Dally M, won the 92 Rothmans, 96 Rugby League Week Player of the Year, won the 92 Clive Churchill, Dally M halfback of the year in, 98, uh, in 88, 94 and 96, uh, four premierships with the Broncos. Incredible career. Um, I was terrified of him in the 90s at origin time. I couldn't work out how he was doing it at his size. Mm. <laughs> I couldn't work out for a guy with what I consider quite a poor kicking game somehow managed to make it happen off the boot all the time as well. Yeah. Um, being a Ricky Stewart fan, I was I was a death riding Alfie at all times, but uh, after he retired, I just realised how amazing this guy was. That was exactly uh, my... My road to Damascus with Langer as well. I was I was so pro Stewart at the time, and then it was only later on that you know you, you get out of your you know dumb origin bias and you realise what a special player he was. And then bringing that um, SOS origin victory, I mean, mm. <laughs> just the cherry on top. So I mean, it must be he must have the competitive spirit um, that you, that you don't see with the with the Larrikin exterior, you know. Yeah, just just to get it done all the time, and, and how he jinxed closer to the line and scored tries at will when needed all the time is just beyond me. Um, I kind of feel that I, I was I was I was reading a, a lot about you know what what people were saying about him at the time today, and funny thing that struck me, and and I, I hope this isn't seen as me diminishing Langer's career, but. There was a lot of talk about him at the time from people like Phil Gould and, and others. When he retired, they were saying that he was one of the all-time greats. I think 15 years on, that's been recalibrated to he was one of the greats of his era. Yeah, I mean, only because of Joey and um, Thurston, I think, just, just surpassing the level. It's sort of like Sterling and uh, Mortimer lost a bit of shine when Alfie yeah. Stewart come along. Um, but at the time, my God. I couldn't imagine anyone owning that Queensland team and dominating uh, Origin at the level he did. I mean, obviously, once Wally Lewis retired. But then, almost instantly, you had Darren Lockyer take over, elevated himself above Langer. Then you had Smith and Thurston come along, elevate themselves even higher, and suddenly you're looking at Alan Langer and you know the fourth or fifth down the ladder in terms of Queensland Origin greats. But look, let's just look at the guy though. I mean, dominated his era, um, kept Stewart out of squads regularly, mm. um, played so far above his weight. It's not funny. Um, it doesn't look like a Athlete, little and a footballer. Yeah, it's just incredible. And when he started, for God's sakes, he was about sixty-five kilos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Amazing, amazing heart. And um, then, then he got the intangibles with this great personality, this larrikin, old school larrikin, and uh, the, the, obviously he still got the enthusiasm for the game. Um, and then apparently he used to vomit before every match due to nerves. That, that to me is an intangible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that he was well, that good, but he was he still nervous every game. I'll, I'll read you some of the um, the Larrikin stuff because uh, Joey was actually interviewed in 2002. Well, actually, um, Alfie and Joey were both interviewed about each other. Um, yeah, so Joey Joey was talking about rooming with, with Alfie uh, in 99 just before Langer retired for the first time. Um, he said, We had a great week in camp. We had a lot in common. We'd sit in our room and have a bet on the horses and eat our chips and gravy rolls late at night. I was wrapped. He's that good a fella. <laughs> Couple of real Renaissance men. <laughs> <laughs> but then he, he went on to talk about 
Alan Langer, the player, and he said, he's the best player I've ever played against and he's the best half I've seen. See, that's high praise. I mean, Yeah. And uh, you know, for his part, Langer said that he and, he and Joey were great mates. We have a beer together after a game. It won't be any different after Origin. I, I wonder if that friendship was maintained. I think almost certainly. They're, they're peas in a pod. Yeah. I think they'll still be having beers, still be betting on horses. Mm-hmm. I wonder um, if the, um, the, you know, running the water for <laughs> 15 years diminishes him in the eyes of maybe younger people who, who never got to really see him. Um, I think so to a certain degree, actually. It's it's not very uh, not very regal, is it, for no. not really royalty? But he loves it so much, it's, I think it's great for the game. Yeah. Yeah, it's something a, that... W- one negative about him, though, is that he did play in the superstar squads. Yeah, true, but I mean... Went to, went to Warrington, didn't he, and played in a, a non-superstar squad, so... Mm. But I mean, he... Went from basically being forcibly retired by Wayne Bennett, going over to Warrington, obviously rediscovered some passion for the game there and came back. His 2002 season, he, he got injured late in it, which kind of hampered him. And, you know, I think in his last game, he had a calf injury and went off after an hour or so. But before his injuries, he was in like almost career best form. Um, I don't like when the careers are punctuated like that, Michael Jordan style, you know. But um, uh, oh, I think it, it's definitely a selling point in in the Langer story. I mean, not that he could have retired in nineteen ninety nine and and stuck with it, and I think he's still a Hall of Fame without question. Um, yeah, well, there's not much point talking about him any further except to say that he was absolutely incredible. Yeah, and perhaps like like you pointed out, underrated at this stage. Yeah, I I really think he is. And and I think it is something we take for granted, the fact that he's just there on the field for like 60 minutes of every Broncos game and, and you know, we, we just accept it when like one of the greats of the game is just <laughs> hanging out in fluoro. <laughs> I do love the fact that he, that he still loves it though, but um, also the fact that when he played, you didn't have to be perfect like Cooper Cronk or Jonathan Thurston. You could sort of be a bit quiet for a few portion of the game and then inject yourself and then you know, break the line, close the line and win the game, that type of thing. Like mm. The halfback role wasn't as high pressure. So, and obviously, it was the game manager role still back then, but um, probably didn't have the consistency of John Thurston or yeah. <clears throat> Cooper Cronk. But yeah, so but, obviously, no, 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 no arguments. He, he's in the Hall of Fame. That's one spot. I just... We've gone back and forth on, on this bloke. This is one of the guys in our catchment. I, today, watched a highlights package of Greg Alexander. It was a four-part, 40, minute, 40 minutes total video on YouTube. Like That guy was incredible. And to call him a I've been thinking about tier, it, too. I've been thinking about it independently, and I want him in. I, I do, we're, too. We're, we're, I think we've been a disgrace debating it this long. I... I want him in so so much, and the heart wants what the heart wants. You want him in. Well, I, I went, went back and read some of the listener comments, actually, through some of the old posts on these Hall of Fame discussions. There's so much love for him out there. It's like, what are we debating? Yeah. Um, just one thing I want to say about him. So many times in, in the highlights package I watched, there's so many examples of him starting the play, passing, you know, he's, he's in his own 20, he starts to play, makes a break with his lightning speed, great step, puts a par- pass off, Panthers are out in space, and then suddenly 80, 80 metres later, who's there catching the last pass to finish it off? Brandy. Yeah, he was like Bar-esque and he's backing up. Mm. He played like a 5 eighth with his running game, but with all the skills of an organising halfback, those chip and chases he did, like he was... A phenomenal player. The argument we were having with ourselves was the fact that he only had the first half of the, the career was outstanding due to the tragedies and what have you. But we've been through it again. We said it earlier. Clyde, Stewart, all these guys are um, top heavy on their best years in the, mm. in the career. Let's put him in. Yeah. So I, I think he's above any of the other 
beyond Langer, I think he's above any of the other players we're discussing tonight. So I want Brandy in. So we want him in. He's a formal, in. formal apology to Brandy for <laughs> procrastinating for so long. But anyway, I'm happy to have him in. So um, so they're they're the two we're going to put in tonight. We'll leave as we've started doing a lot lately. We're going to leave that third spot open. Open it up to the listeners. Let's have a week of debate. Who well, makes well, it? Well, 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 let's just have it. Brasher v. B. B. Mullins. Um, maybe put a bit of the arguments in the in the post, and we'll see what see what the listeners think. Because uh, some more uh, open minds might help us here. Yeah. So, yeah, I think they're they're the only two players we can reasonably keep alive out of this year's class. Um, so yeah, tell us what you think. Mullins, Brasher, either or. Do we keep them both alive? Do we write them both off? Uh, who are we putting in this week, if anybody? Uh, Ken Nagus for mine is, is is a is a talent hall of famer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, every week we seem to get at least one player who is hall of fame talent, not hall of fame career. But at some point, well, we can. You need a hall of fame career, you know. Yeah, it's um, it's not the hall of friends, mate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, I think that was, that was a good um, a good fair discussion. That um, yeah, some good memories in this in that era though, and mm. all those players excited me for, for for many seasons. Matthew Johns, Ken Vegas, Tim Brasher, yeah, Brett Mullins. So anyway, that'll that'll do it for this week. <laughs>